Wake Up MLS Match Day 18. 18. We have two full slates of matches this week. We already got past the midweek one. Ton of crazy upsets. This is probably the worst pickums week we've had in quite some time. The most MLS week of all time from my perspective. But that does not change anything. We keep the show rolling, keep the picks coming in. And tonight's episode is going to be an absolute banger. I am joined by a very special guest. I'm excited to, that he's here. I'm excited to call him a friend. And more importantly, a content creator that you should be tuning into if you haven't already. I am joined by MLS Moves here on Wake Up MLS. Will, my man, how are you doing today? Doing good, man. Doing good. Always love to talk ball with some friends, man. There is not enough people in Tennessee in my area who love ball as much as the people I've met on Twitter. So uh, it's always fun, man. I can't wait to talk about some some MLS for good or bad. You know, I'm, I'm just excited to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely, bro. I, I, I'm glad you put th through bad in there because as an SC Dallas fan, there's a lot of bad that we could talk about this week. But we'll get to it. No, no spoilers <laughs> for this week. Um, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself like a broken record when it comes to my team on the show but we will get into it they are on the agenda for today and for those who are not familiar with the format of how wake up mls works it's very very simple we're going to dive into five five key matchups in detail preview them a little bit um make our picks on how we see those individual matches going and then towards the end the, the other eight matches on the horizon will quick fire predict those and Keep receipts, guys. Keep receipts. Let us know the comments down below whether or not you agree with any of our picks. Hold us accountable after the Saturday slate of matches come and go. That's the beauty of this show. It's a ton of fun. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. The first match on the docket for today, Inter-Miami coming off of a very interesting result against Atlanta, uh, hosting St. Louis City SC. And so it, 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 the stats and the narrative, if you will, on the screen for everybody to kind of you know take in. Miami coming off of that weird 3-1 L to Atlanta, but still sitting top of the East, looking very good. And then you have the sophomore slump of St. Louis City SC. 3-7-4, and four, 16 points, sitting 11th in the West, just above FC Dallas. And it's it feels weird to even say both of those teams are at this point, at this point of the season. 2-1 loss to, I don't want to say the down bad Seattle Sounders, but they really haven't been their normal selves. They've been in a really weird spot. Man, this this match has so many interesting pieces to it from my perspective. But with that said, I fully expect the Barca boys to be back for this one. Um, I think everyone is still kind of shell shocked watching Pineda's men over Atlanta take down Inter Miami when he's in the hot seat himself. Wild time in MLS right now. Will, my man, how do you see this one really going? Is it as straightforward as just saying, look, it's Miami. They had a weird week. They're definitely going to bounce back in this one. Or is it deeper than that? Well, first of all, like you just said about Pineda, he's got to be number one on many people's list for uh, coaches on the hot seat. The Titanic looked like it was finally sh uh, you know, sinking and it was going to hit the bottom. And he's got the thing still afloat. Um, so... Miami had probably the worst game I've seen them have in a long time. Suarez, Busquets, um, you know, Julian Gressel, several players just look kind of like lethargic and out of touch with the game. A lot yeah. of open space in that match, man. Al Almada was uncovered in the midfield. It looked like there wasn't a guy 10, 15 yards, away, you know, close to him. So I think that that was just kind of like a one off. Um, and, and I think that they'll be motivated, especially with this being a lot of the guys last game for several weeks, right? I mean, I, they said Messi was uh, going to report with the Argentine national team, I think, on Monday. So this is kind of like his farewell game for the summer, at least in, re in uh, regular season play, because as soon as he gets back, he'll probably take a break with, you know, uh, after the Copa America. Uh, he probably will play in League's Cup. So he, he might not play a regular season match again until August. So I expect them. Well, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? That, that's kind of yeah. crazy to think about. But I think that the Barca boys, like you said, um, will will definitely have a redemption game. Um, I think Messi's going to have a redemption game. I think Suarez is going to have. Even though Messi didn't have a bad game, he's going to still have a redemption game. He's going to have two goals. I think. I I think he's going to go off on a perfect uh, note. Uh, you know, before he leaves for the Argentine national team. Yeah, I agree, man. And I think, you know, from St. Louis's perspective, it, this would be a game where if I was a St. Louis City SC fan, I would be thinking to myself, at least maybe this is probably some of the, the trap mentality. I'd be thinking, oh, they, they literally just got beat by a very down bad Atlanta team. Why can't we do that? Why can't we also be those guys? And it's like, 
I don't see Inter Miami having two of those games in a row. I just don't see it happening. They're so good at home. They're the number one team in the league in terms of goals scored per 90 this season. And then you have St. Louis. When you look, look at them statistically, bro, they are literally – one, they've lost all three of the last matches they've had. They uh, haven't won an away game now. I think in like nine or ten. I think it's nine. Um, mm-hmm. There's just so many statistics that don't go in their favor – so while I can see, I've seen some of the fans on the timeline already say, hey, look, this game against Atlanta should be giving us some hope. They were down bad. Pineda, you know, was really in the hottest managerial seat. You can argue that game against Miami. I don't know if it saved his job for the rest of the season, but it definitely bought him some more time. So we'll we'll, and we'll, we'll talk about Atlanta a little bit today. But yeah. I, I just don't think... I'm really inclined to agree with you, man. I don't think St. Louis have a shot in hell in this game. I think if it was at City Park, maybe you could argue a little bit of the home field advantage. But even then, teams have walked into that stadium and beaten them. So, yeah, man, I mean, how, how do you see the score line going? How bad is it going to be? Well, you just brought it up perfectly about, you know, even at home, their fortress, right? The, the shine has kind of faded away. Um, you know, I could see it. I mean, that's the thing with with Miami that it can get ugly, man. Like even when they're losing, I remember uh, who was it? Uh, the Red Bulls. They were up. Oh, you know, God. the Red Bulls were up one nil, and it was looking bad. Like Miami looked like they were old and washed, and then they end up winning the damn game six to one. They just turned you know? it on, just man. like that. You know, second half, six goals, right? Or maybe it yeah. was five goals in the second half. So, um, I, I think that if they play to like the Miami we're accustomed to seeing this year. Uh, I think it could easily be a three nil result, easily. Yeah, easily. I, it, it's not. It's not even like a conservative bet. I don't think. I think easily it could be be three nil. I I think, man. I you know, they, granted, St. Louis haven't had Leuven for a good chunk of this season. That's that is their go to playmaker, and uh, at some point he's got to come back and make an impact, right? And of course, I'm being respectable and understandable of his situation at home and how tough that's going to be for him. But yeah. with that said, I mean. St. Louis need for their fan base for everything that they work towards at, at, you know last season there, there has to be like a little bit of a, a pride game factor to this if, if there was ever going to be a shot for St. Louis to turn this around positively heading into summer heading into leagues cup and everything beyond that this there has to be a game where they can prove it right against a powerhouse of a team and it doesn't get more powerhouse than inter Miami in this league it really doesn't so it, I, I'm with you. I think this is going to be like a 3-0. Maybe you give St. Louis a goal and say 3-1 or 4-1, but I fully expect Miami to kind of run this game down. If they don't, though, and before we move on, if they don't and they cough up two bad games in a row, should Miami fans start getting worried or would that be an overreaction? Well, I think it'd be an overreaction just because we have to take into account how many injuries this team has had. I mean, yeah. they just lost probably their best center back for the season and, and Friere. And they have Kristoff, who it might be 34 in age, you know, number, <laughs> but he plays like he's 54. He looks like he's 54. He looks like he's 54. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He looks like he's 54. I want to see some uh, birth records. You know, I, I don't know what, how we get those, but I, I like to see what, what the actual date of birth is on him. But, uh, yeah, so I think that that has to take into account uh, – with with the foreign suit, you just saw the back line was vulnerable. You know, Kristoff is such a liability. And even though Atlanta has their issues, they still have talent. And I think that when you have a guy like Kristoff on an island, you're probably going to get cooked nine out of ten times. So I think once they solidify, maybe with a couple reinforcements this summer, maybe a center back or two, uh, maybe Di Maria. You know, we heard about him looking like he's agreed to terms with Miami. That's been the reports. Uh, I mean, this is going to be a damn super team, man. It's going to be even crazier than what it already is. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly, man. And it's kind of crazy, right? The, the idea of like needing a center back, but going out and getting Di, get Di Maria <laughs> as just like yeah. doing what super teams do. And that is just reinforcing with pure talent, regardless of position. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I think that's going to be wild if it does happen. But either way, I think collectively, we have Miami going through on this one. St. Louis City fans, let us know in the comments down below. Is there a saving grace for this team? When is it going to show up? When are we going to see the 2023 version of this team? Or more importantly, was that just a one-off? Was it a one-season wonder? And this is what we can expect maybe from St. Louis moving forward. I don't really know. The rest of the season will tell. But Well, let- well I, I will say one more thing about St. Louis, yeah. if you don't mind, Jose. It, I think that this is a uh, this just speaks to what happens when you don't make a significant change in the offseason. You just run it back. 
Mm. In MLS, teams are getting better every year. Even teams who are spending, you know, we won't, I won't say any specific names because we're going to talk about them later, but even teams who do spend money on players to make their team better, even they struggle. So if you don't do anything in, in MLS, like during the offseason, and just run it back, that's where it can be problematic, especially if you have an injury, like you said, and Loven, like being out for the season, they don't really have a lot of depth and it's really showing this year. And, and that's, you know, this is kind of like the harsh reality of like what MLS is. Yeah, I agree. I think you you, you kind of have to reinforce. What, what's the saying, right? You have to reinforce when you're on top to stay on top. Exactly. I, I, I agree. I think that, you know, not that, and, and who knows, right? Last season with the vibes and how quickly they started, you know, maybe there's a lot of that at play as well with the fans and kind of just riding momentum. But if you mm -hmm. can't get momentum starting this season, the way you did last season, it's so easy for that to flip a switch and the momentum be going downward, right? And you kind of can't get out of this funk when it comes to how these matches are, are just not going your way, L after L after L. Uh, they have a ton of draws. I mean, look at seven draws and four losses. I mean, mm. it's it's a point to point. Don't get me wrong. But at some point, you need to start converting these chances and converting these matches into wins, one point to three points. And if that were to happen this week, maybe it's the positive note that they can use to kind of snowball this into something really sort of season saving, if you will. I don't know. We'll find out. But St. Louis City fans, pray to God that Barca boys don't just absolutely turn it on and destroy the team. Because if they do, who knows what happens to St. Louis City after a, a game. As bad as they've kind of been over the last like month, if they get absolutely destroyed by Miami, I don't know what that does for morale. So... Well, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. But let's uh, let's move on. We got a second matchup here in the West. Real Salt Lake, the top dogs hosting Austin FC, and a really interesting Austin FC man. Um, we've had more than a few Austin FC um, takes on this show because they've been such a very weird team. And if you're an Austin fan, more on the positive side of things, right? As compared to 2023 when it was a a lot of negativity coming out of South Texas. <laughs> um, yeah. But with that said, Real Salt Lake, uh -huh. top dogs in the West, 30 points, coming off of a, an interesting draw to Seattle. I thought that was kind of weird. Uh, but again, midweek MLS, I feel like you know last night's games were just wild and weird. Um, Austin FC also coming off a loss to Portland 2-0 at home at the Q2, which stood out to me in a really weird way. But 23 points, top five in the West. I think a lot of Austin FC fans will pay attention to what happened in the game last night. For those who did not tune in, um, their golden boy, their talisman, Sebastian Driussi, uh, missed a PK, missed a pretty wide open sitter, and then got injured, of all things. Um, and who knows? I, I have not checked on how long he's really going to be out. Um, but I think that's going to drastically affect the way this team plays. So with that said, man, in my opinion, Real Salt Lake are absolute dogs. These guys, led by Chicho Arango and Diego Luna, are absolutely cooking in this league at the moment. Um, they've had some weird results back-to-back, -back, but I feel like maybe that's an anomaly. I'm not really sure. How do you see this one going well? Oh, man. this is. Th I think this could be another uh, weird game because, you know, like you said, the, both of these teams are coming off of weird results, right? I mean, yeah. I, I think obviously RSL should have handled Seattle with both teams' form uh, what it is this, this season. And then obviously Austin FC has had a bounce back. They played a lot better. Uh, you know, compared to their their dreadful 2022 season or 2023 season, I'm sorry, 2022 was actually good. Uh, yeah. and, and it's crazy. You know, you talk about Dreyusi. He was a legitimate MVP candidate in 2022, and that seems like so long ago because of how bad uh, last season was. And if they can, you know, whenever he gets healthy and everything kind of like you know culminates again, and they they just signed a. Uh, I think his name is Osman Berkey. He's a Ghanaian international winger yep. uh, from, uh, I think it's a Serbian side. I, I can't Red remember. Star, Red, Red Star. Red Star. Belgrade. Red Star. Exactly. Yes. Um, he looks like he could be a game changer, kind of like what Regroni was supposed to be, but never was. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if, if Dryusi, that's that's the thing with all these clubs, man. It's like they got one guy and they expect them to do everything. They don't actually surround them. It, it's a problem with Nashville. They had Hani Mukhtar and they just kind of like rode him into the ground and expected him to do everything you have even good players need help you know yeah. like you can't do everything yourself so um obviously he's not gonna be playing in this match but it's just nice to see the trend that they're they're back up um i'm still not sold on josh wolf 
I think RSL is definitely the better team. I think that they're going to have a bounce back game. Chicho Rongo is my MVP leader right now just because of how well he's been playing. And Diego Luna, I think, is going to have a chip on his shoulder because he wasn't included on on the Olympic roster, uh, yeah. the preliminary. I, and he's been playing good, right? He kind of started off slow at the beginning of the season. He started he started ramping up a little bit uh, the last couple of weeks. And I think he's going to have a chip on his shoulder. And I think RSL is probably going to uh, – hey, listen, I'm not trying to, to uh, open wounds here, uh, you know, healed wounds here. But uh, you, you saw what they did to Dallas, man. Dallas looked like they had in the bag three to one. And look what oh, happened. Man. That That's that's what this team can do, you know? Crazy, bro. It's crazy. And you know what? I will say this too. Like even in that game, we were up 3-0. I, I think every Dallas fan felt like – Salt Lake's going to have a say in this. At some point, there, there's no way they're just going to let a, a team towards the bottom of the table step all over them, even if it isn't a, a road game for them. And the minute that – when the first goal went in, I was like, okay, sure, it's real Salt Lake. But when the second goal went in, that banger in the top left corner, I immediately thought to myself, this is game. Like, they're going to find a way with 20 minutes left to net out an equalizer, and they'll at least walk out of here with the point. And they did, right? And I think that was a really weird game. You know, granted, it was Texas. It's super hot. They're not used to that. There's there's elements at play in summer. If you have to travel to Texas in MLS, putting hard miles, right, because of how big the U.S. country is, putting hard yeah. miles on the road and then playing in 90-degree heat, 80-plus percent humidity, like, yeah, that's going to fuck with you. Of course it will, right? Why wouldn't it? Um, I think that, that there was some of that at play with the Real Salt Lake SC Dallas game. In this game, they're going to be at home. And I think if Driussi is missing – Man, I had this weird, really weird take that I think with Austin, as much as they've overperformed, and that's what this this has been for me. Is not that they're a bad team, they're just not like a great team, right? Yeah. Like they're like you the Hanny Mukhtar comparison, bro, was was spot on. Like that's probably the best way to put it. They are so reliant upon Driussi that if he picks up a knock, if he's out of form, even a little bit, right? We saw it last night. It's like the team can't get going. It's like they really need him to like be at a hundred percent every single game or it's going to be an off day for them and yeah now right he's picked up a knock are we going to see this top five team in the west so far that's still technically in a rebuild mode start to dwindle down the standings a little bit and maybe level out to where we all kind of expected them to be at the start of the season when they didn't even know if they were going to be able to field a true starting 11 without bringing in academy players and things like that because they were just getting rid of so much talent as part of this rebuild. I don't know, man. I mean, maybe, maybe a course corrects itself. I'm not really sure. Players will have to step up in Driussi's absence. And to top it all off, man, this is, this is like a, a potential like negative stepping stone for them because here in a, in a couple of weeks, Danny Pereira, uh, Julio Cascante, these key players that are being shipped out to Copa America are going to be gone. And and Drew C as well as those other key players are not in the mix. What happens to Austin FC at that point, right? Like that's my big kind of outstanding question. I feel like right now is maybe the calm before the storm for Austin. I don't know how you feel about that. No, I agree. And I will say this: if Drew C like for sure does not play in this match Saturday, and it looks like he won't, obviously. Yeah. Um, I would say that this is arguably one of the biggest wins in Josh Wolf's career to be a fully. Uh, armed RSL club without your guy who makes everything work like we just talked about like you know it almost feels like when Dryusi's not on the team or not playing at his best like you said he, they malfunction like they yeah. just can't they can't work so that would be very impressive hell I think even a, a draw would be impressive at this point you know if they come out with a point that would be impressive um, I just think it's going to be hard because RSL is just such a good team and even good teams have off games yeah. That's just how it is. Nobody's 100% perfect unless uh, you're uh, Galatasaray, apparently, because they <laughs> they have like 102 points this this year, which is fucking insane. Yeah. It, can you believe that? That Bashi I think it's uh, – which which club was – I think it's Bashikas uh, is number two. Have you ever heard of a team having 99 points in the table and finishing in second place? That no. is fucking absurd. No, man, the Turkish Super League is wild. Like, and and, and yeah, and just to, to, to piggyback what you're saying, like any any anything north of ninety, you would feel like that's going to lock up the title no matter what. Like and, historic season, right? That's like yeah, a historic, a historic you know? season. Like Arsenal in the Premier League got eighty nine points, the best point total they've had like in the modern era of the Premier League, and like didn't matter. They lost it, right? They got second. Yeah. It's just, it, I think it's just the sign yeah. of the times, maybe. I don't know. That's just crazy. But but yeah, to, you know, I think the RSL 
Um, it has to be favored in this match. I think yeah. the worst case scenario, they're going to get a draw. I don't see that happening. I think Chicho Rongo continues his hot streak. Um, I mean, he's he's been the best player in the league at this at this point. And and you know, some Messi fans, you know, I, I mean, I that I think that's the best player of all time. I'm a Messi fan. I'm yeah. not inner Miami fan, but I'm a fan of Messi long before he ever came here. Uh, Chicho Rongo is playing the best of any player in the league right now. He's got the most uh, goals, and I think he's like second or third in assists right now. He's just having an absolutely incredible season. Yeah, it's crazy, bro. It's so insane because, like, there were so many teams. You think back uh, to when he came from Pachuca, like, there were so many teams that needed a striker that could have mm-hmm. gone out and got a rango, and, like, they, 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 were, they hesitated for some reason. Even a lot of fans. I remember, you know, like Sounders fans, for example, like, there were some – uh, even Ray Green TV, they were ca- kind of calling for like a change of the guard, right? Like Rui Diaz kind of moving on, or maybe Jordan Morris moving on because they needed some fr- uh, like some fresh blood at the striker position or the attacking positions. And mm-hmm. a lot of fans I saw in the comments did not rate Arango. It's crazy, bro. Like insane. It, it blows my mind now to see him in Salt Lake, and the guy's absolutely balling. And, and, and at home, if you did not, if you voted for All Star already for MLS All Star Week, and you did not have this man. You're starting eleven, bro. Shame, shame on you. In all you're honesty, you're just a hater, like, right? You're just yeah, a hater fucking hater. Or... Yeah, by far, bro. By far, or you're like not watching RSL. Either one, right? <laughs> Either one. That or like maybe I don't know. Maybe like a hard inter Miami fan, and you got like Suarez, Messi, and like Denny Bowanga or somebody up top. And like which case, you know what, man? If you're a Miami fan, I get it. But like Arango has been so damn good. He was easily the first position I locked up in my MLS starting eleven. Um, but yeah, man, I think he's he's been insane. And, like, the last point I'll make before we move on is that point you made about Josh Wolf and how he might be able to elevate the status that he has down in Austin. Because I'll I'll be honest, bro, I don't think think you're the only one that's really kind of worried about him still being at the helm. It really is, like, the fans all the way around. Or, you know, Wolf out is still a thing, bro. It's, It's still very much a thing. And if he were to silence his critics with a massive win over RSL despite not having Drewsy... Bro, it's uh, he's not going anywhere. Like it's Wolf in all the way through. Like I think, uh, he's done enough already. I would say to this point to at least you know kind of stick stick around f- through the end of the season. But he can ha- make a strong case for himself to stick around beyond that if he starts putting together a string of these results against big teams. We saw it against the Galaxy at home with the Q two two nil in that crazy early early game um, a few weeks back, and now they have another shot at it against RSL. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it happens, man. But I have this game. I think it's going to be a 2 nothing RSL. I think it's going to be clinical. I think it's going to be Arango, uh, a goal and an assist. I don't know who gets the second one. Maybe it's a Craylock. Maybe it's a Luna. I don't really know. But I think uh, this is going to be – it's going gonna, it's gonna to feel like a pretty straightforward win and get them back to winning ways. How do you see it going? I think it's going to be th- I think it's going to be 3 no, honestly, RSL. I think I think Chicho could have a brace. And I see, I see Luna – I'd see Luna being involved with all three goals. He just finds his way to be involved, and especially more recently. Um, I could see Luna pulling one back, maybe even Gomez. Uh, you know, but I, I think I could see Chicho having having a brace, man. I just think he's just that good right now. And I'm honestly, I think he deserves to have a call up to to Colombia, man. Uh, with with uh, the Copa for Copa America, people are kind of disagreeing with me on that. Like, no, man, you can't take him. Like, get take Cucho. And I'm like, look, I love Cucho. I think Cucho is a very fun player. But you can't argue that that he's better than Chicho Arango at this moment. But you can also play both. Like, like at yeah, the end could. of the day, yeah, right? Because Cucho can play on the wing. Like, I, I've seen him do it. And I granted, you know, it's it's Colombia. They have all all kinds of you know attacking talent that they could probably tap on at least talent that's comparable to the likes of Cucho Hernandez and, and Chicho Arango. But I still think that, like, I agree with you. I think Arango, for whatever reason, is the more clinical striker. I think Cucho is just naturally gifted. And he is. He could just play anywhere in the attack. So I, I, I see a scenario where you can play both of them. But, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I think Arango definitely deserves some love, some flowers when it comes to his involvement with his uh, potential national team. Hey, form matters, man. And he's in the best form I've ever seen him in. So. Yeah, it's crazy, bro. Beyond the LAFC form, which is wild to say. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, man. Again, we, we we both collectively have RSL going through. I think to me, it'll be insane if Austin makes this a game. We'll find out. All right, on to the third matchup. Um, I'm not super excited to talk about this one, but we'll do it anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> LAFC hosting FC Dallas. LAFC, man, kind of looking better week over week. 8-3-4, and 27 points, top three in the West now. Big, big win last night over Minnesota and a hell of a goal 
by Bogush, man. That that rip from distance was insane. We'll talk about it. And then, they're, again, they're hosting FC Dallas. Very weird season. Of course, they still have a few key, very key injuries that, you know, uh, I think they could probably keep using as an excuse up to this point. But we'll see how long that lasts. Uh, 13 points, 12th in the West, coming off of uh, a, a pretty close game. But nonetheless, a 3-1 loss to the Galaxy in Carson. A red card to boot, two penalty kicks given away. A crazy game against the Galaxy, which I think it always kind of is. But let's talk about LAFC first. Um, I think with, with LAFC and kind of how they started this season and where they are today, I think if you're an LAFC fan, if you remember the 3-2-5-2, you feel better about this team now than how you felt when the season kicked off. Um, Bawanga is not in prime Bawanga form just yet, but I think other pieces are compensating for that. And you have a team now that is very exciting to watch. You know, at the end of the day, LAFC, man, I mean, they're still top 10 in goal scored per match. They're the best team in MLS at home this season. They've won their last six after kind of sputtering to kind of kick off 2024, right? And they're going up against a weekend FC Dallas team. But keep in mind, the last time these two teams met last season at the very beginning of the year, for those who do not remember, crazy game. LAFC scored for first, Dallas equalized. This was the game where Denny Bowanga went to, he was still kind of relatively, not unknown, but just he'd only played like a couple of games for LAFC so far. But he had that international call-up. Um, is he, I can't remember what national team he plays for. Like oh, Denny Bowanga? Yeah, is it? Like, it's like Gabon. Gabon? Or G- yeah, or Gabon, like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he went to go play. He flies back the same day of the game. He lands like late, like he lands in LA like 45 minutes before the game starts. So he gets there like uh, maybe like ha- close to halftime. He comes in with like 10, 15 minutes left to play in the game, scores the game winner. And it was it was like the era of Bawanga had started in, in, in MLS right when that happened. And I won't forget it. It was a dagger in the heart for all Dallas fans. We lost that game 2-1. I really hope we're as competitive in this game as we were in that game. But nonetheless, LA both both teams look drastically different. So, Will, I'll turn it over to you, man. From your perspective, this LAFC team, what do you like about them so far? I, I imagine you're pretty impressed with them at home. How bad can they make Dallas look in this game? Well, first off, I want to say it feels like Dallas just has a natural rivalry with both L.A. teams. Like anytime they play, I feel like it's always close, either the Galaxy yeah. or LAFC, LAFC. It's always a, normally a pretty good game. Um, LAFC is interesting, right? Because they have a lot of holes on their team. And like you said, they start off very slow um, at the beginning of the season. And I kind of was under the impression like, OK, well, let's just see if they can kind of get by until the summer transfer window, get these pieces in, and then maybe make a deep run. No, they're actually firing on all cylinders right now before anything comes in. And, you know, they've already signed Giroud. He's going to be here in July. They reported today that uh, Griezmann is, you know, has a $12 million, or or, I'm sorry, a 12 million pound release clause, which LAFC could easily afford. And I think they're going to try to get him to come over here this summer. So, yeah, this team is scary as hell, man. And they're heating up. They've got talent all over the damn place. Uh, I think their defense is still kind of like a question mark. I'm not, you know, losing Chiellini this year uh, to retirement was a big loss. I, I'm, I think Aaron Long is still very suspect. Um, you know, Segura was has been playing in the uh, the midfield. He's been doing okay there. Um, I, I don't know. I just think they, they there's a couple pieces they need, but in their current form, and obviously Dallas's current form. I have to give the edge to to LAFC at this moment, man. They're yeah. just they're just they're just too good right now. Honestly, bro, you'd be stupid not to. Um, I think anybody would, to be honest. Like like LAFC, uh, of course. Even if Dallas was in, let's say, even twenty twenty three form wasn't crazy. We were a playoff team, but I would say you know we were like a mid team, um, middle of the table team. I think um, you know with with how much star power they have, this is what we expect of LAFC at this point. But I agree with what you said wholeheartedly. I think this is the week that we're in LA. We just played the Galaxy. And if you didn't watch the game, it, you can look at the scoreline and be like, oh, okay, it was a pretty clinical win for the Galaxy. But it was actually very close. I mean, they scored very early the first three minutes. Um, but the equalizer by Dallas was beautiful. A, a one-timer by Patrickson Delgado. Um, and, and there were chances on both sides. Even when we went down 2-1, it was because we gave up two penalties. The first penalty kick was saved by Martin Foss. The second one was not. We let it in. 
But if it wasn't for the red card in the 83rd minute when we're actually like creating chances, trying to net the equalizer, this this could have been an even closer game than the, what the score line kind of alluded to. So, you know, I I agree with you on, on how difficult this will be for Dallas, despite how well we seem to play against these L.A. sides. I think if we're going to have a chance in hell, man, it's going to be on the back of Martin Boss. I think Martin Boss as a keeper... Brother, if we didn't have Martin Boss, I can't even imagine how bad Dallas would be. Like, it's insane. Sometimes the defense is non-existent, and this man is still making save after save after save. For those who don't believe me, go watch the first penalty kick that, that um, I think I think it was Gabriel Peck who took it, not Jovalich. Jovalich took the second one. I think it was Peck took the first one. Go watch that. Uh, hell of a save. And then even the rebound shot that came in on the back of that penalty kick was also saved. His shot-to-save ratio has got to be insane by this point. I feel like he is the best player that we have. He's criminally underpaid. And at some point, man, th this team needs to become what we all know it can be potential-wise. Otherwise, you know, a player of that caliber is going to end up moving on. So, But for the sake of this game, Martin Boss needs to have another like world-class performance. It really needs to be on the back of him. I think if we can walk into the second half still scoreless right on both sides then everything's up for grabs in the second half and you know, we will be stretched don't get me wrong the likes of Tillman, Bogush, Bawanga will make things very very difficult for our our back three defense and I hate saying that because the, 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 the tactics by Nico Estevez this is terrorist football that I'm watching bro this is this is God, man, I, I really can't watch it anymore. I like I, I will because it's my team and I, I won't ever give up on them, but it is painful watching these tactics, watching us just give up control of games. And this was a team that was the number two in the West defensively last year. And now we're, we're leaking goals like crazy and we don't adjust. We run the same 3-4-3 or 3-5-2 formation and just keep trying. <laughs> it's, it's, it's honestly insanity. But with that said, and we'll be missing Tafari for this one. He got a red card in the last game. So he, our starting, our best center back will not be available for this game. Martin Boss needs to have the game of his life, in all honesty, if I have a chance at this. But with that said, I don't want to get more depressed than I already am. <laughs> I'm going to call this game. I'll go with what I said about the Galaxy 2. Um, the same exact score line. I think it's going to be 2-1 LAFC. Um, I, I still think we can score. I still think that, that LAFC is susceptible to letting a goal in. Uh, even you know the 37, 38 year old Hugo Lloris, uh, but I fully expect uh, their attacking talent to be firing all cylinders. So it could be worse than that. I don't really know, but I think two one LAFC. How do you see it? It's a tough one, man. Um, I think that like on a, lo a long road trip like this, especially when you talk about how they played really good against the Galaxy, maybe the score line doesn't show that, but they did, right? It was kind of like at the end it fell apart and a penalty, and obviously Ricky Pooch is like kind of crazy goal at the end uh, when it was oh, like, bro. yeah, <laughs> that goal. I mean, look, everyone was like absolutely freaking out about that goal, and that's cool. But we were down to ten men already. There was nobody in the back. Like he, he literally got a free ride all the way up to Martin Boss and then just tapped it in. Like it was, yeah. It was. It but, looked but good, was, but there was nobody back there. That was kind of like the the nail in the coffin, though, right? Yeah, that was kind of yeah. like, all right, it's over, right? It's over. So, so uh, I don't know. I, I feel like sometimes when these trips, you know, you can kind of be like, all right, man, I'm ready to be back home. Oh shit, we got another game. Uh, I I think honestly, like, I I think two one would be more optimistic. Just to be yeah. honest with you, I think it. I think it'd probably be like two two nil is what I'm thinking. LAFC because I, I don't know if you had a chance to. I, I guess you didn't because it was on at the same time. By the way, MLS, can we fix this? Can we actually have games spread out so we can fucking watch more than like two a day uh, and not just have to rely on highlights? Yeah. Um, but but the uh, LAFC and Minnesota United game, man, LAFC could have easily had five or six goals. Like they were creating chances like crazy. Yeah. There were some unbelievable saves uh, by by St. Clair. And if not for that, LAFC could have easily won six nil easily. They, I mean, I'm telling you, there were so many just on the platter. So I think that two nil is what I'm predicting. And I think that if Dallas is lucky, it'll be like two one. I yeah. think I, I find it hard to believe in getting a point at least. Yeah, it's it's honestly, bro, it's not even a bad shout. Like I, I think, and when I say there were chances on both sides of the game against the Galaxy last night, like uh, they, there were for sure, like there were, but like, uh, and, but if you go back and you look at all the stats and everything, Galaxy absolutely, from an XG perspective, ripped us apart. I think for the chances that we had, almost every single one of our shots was on target. Uh, we had good possession in their half. 
we pinned them back despite in so many um, situations them outnumbering us it, it's just situationally all over the pitch we still found a way to kind of play through their defense and for me considering how we started the season that's progression but uh, yeah I, I think in all honesty man I'll just say this until we move away from whatever this poor man's version of Burhalter ball that Nico Estevez wants to play right now, until we move away from that, I don't think Dallas is going to have a chance against any of these big sides. I just don't. We'll we'll beat the you know we've beaten Houston, you know we've beaten Austin, uh, we've beaten San Jose, right? We'll beat those teams towards the bottom of the table, and and that'll maybe save Nico's job this season. But we're not going to have a shot in hell against the LAFCs of the world because. This formation, these tactics, I'm sorry, man. For the personnel that we have, they just don't fucking work. They don't work. Like, and any good manager, we're on match day 18, and we're still trying to make this system work. Like, what are we doing? Like, I, I have no idea. At some point, there needs to be a ch either a change managerially, which would be my preference, or we need Nico to swallow his fucking pride and move back to last year's tactics and formation. Move back to a 4 2 3 1, give us more control of the ball so we can have more control of the games and maybe, maybe salvage this season. But maybe a new medical staff, too. You know, maybe something oh, that can help with the injuries, right? <laughs> I, I, think, I think the injuries, I, I don't know if Dallas or Seattle ha, or even Miami has the, the honor or dishonor of being the most injured club in MLS, but it's damn close. It's like a three way tie, yeah, uh, you know, bad. between all three clubs. And that definitely is, you know, plays a huge factor. Um, yeah, I think uh, Nico is in trouble. If it wasn't for Pineda kind of like taking away the spotlight of worst manager in MLS right now, or Vermees possibly, I think Nico would have more uh, pressure on him. But it's kind of hard to, you know, overlook those guys for him at this moment. That, that's how I would rank them, actually. It really would be because of the expectation, Pineda first. Because, again, Atlanta was supposed to be a good team this season. So I would say Pineda first. For me, for the second year in a row, your team just looks like dog shit. I think that they, they got lucky that a couple of players got really hot in May and they just rode that momentum all the way to playoffs. Um, but I think he got lucky. And now we're seeing, again, kind of the same SKC team we saw at the beginning of last year. And with Nico, it's just weird. Like, he's been here. This is his third season. He's never gone through a run like this. And, and in fact, you know, teams under Nico Estevez, we've never been, like, super flashy offensively. Thank God we've had Jesus Ferreira, and you know he has the individual talent to net the goals that we need. But it, defensively, we've always been pretty solid under Estevez, and it's never looked like this. This is this is bad. Like we're like I've never I can't remember the last time outside of this season I saw Dallas leak three goals so easily to anybody, and now I feel like it's happening every other game. And I don't know, man. I, I, I don't want to rant about man. this anymore. But so, so, listen, I'll I'll be the unbiased because we obviously know w w which hat you're wearing, right? <laughs> uh, but you know, Dallas has talent. We all know that they have a lot of talent. They've been unfortunately injured a lot of these guys, and, and they signed the club record uh, uh, club club record fee for Musa this past uh, winter. There is no excuses. They should not be in 12th place. I don't care who the fucks hurt or who's healthy. They should not be in 12th place. Agreed. That is for the butthole of the league that's for the san jose's that's for the uh new england revolution that's for those clubs who just don't spend or just are that poorly coached and have no talent at all um and by the way it's kind of funny san jose is coached by which former manager who also you know recycle you know how it's funny though that uh even if they had kept the former guy i don't know if the results would be any better but no they wouldn't. this is this is inexcusable that's just how it is this is inexcusable they should be better than what they are I agree. And, and, and you know what? There's a trend there. You just mentioned Luchi Gonzalez. There's a trend there, right? Look, go back and look at all the managers. Like, look, look at the last five or six in SC Dallas history for anybody in the audience. You'll see a trend. Almost all of them have next to no experience prior to coming to FC Dallas. They were promoted from within uh, because they were like a great academy coach. And yes, we have a, a league wide famous academy, and that's awesome. But, you know, it's the first team. You do need some experience to win these types of games in MLS and actually make a run towards a cup that we still never have won. I think that whoever the next hire is going to be, because I don't see Nico sticking around, it's got to be someone with experience. It has to be someone with actual championship experience. I got a shout for that. I think I, I could see this happening. Uh, this, and this is the last thing I'll say about Dallas. Yeah. If things go the way they are at this current rate, I could see Dallas having a reunion with a coach that you're very familiar with 
Oscar Perea if he gets fired with Orlando City. Now, that could be kind of like a, a you know, 50-50 on reception from the fans, but Oscar Perea definitely is the best manager you guys have ever had, in my opinion, or at least you know, in the last like you know I, decade. I, I would agree with that. Yeah, I would and, agree with that. And, and when he coached uh, FC Dallas, you know, uh, before he left for Tijuana, he definitely didn't have the resources like this back then. No. Like his his uh, he's always been able to get the most out of his players and and his resources. And I think this current like Dallas, um, uh, it's the same ownership group, but they're obviously more committed than they ever have been. Mixed with his expertise, knowing Dallas, knowing the academy, I think that that would be a very nice reunion. I would take it. Um, I think I've heard even like um, third degree burn, which those those who haven't heard that pod, it's the FC Dallas pod. Go check them out. They're, they're they're pretty massive. They're so connected to the club. They kind of presented that option a little bit too, right? So I think you're spot on. It's like he would make sense, but he's not available. So it's like we have to you know kind of find a way to make Nico work for the time being, but. You know, again, front office is familiar with him. Uh, the entire, like, you know, um, coaching staff and personnel for those who have been around as long as they have at FC Dallas are also familiar with him. And like you said, he's uh, he's actually an academy guy. He came, I remember when I was in the youth system, actually being coached by Pareja uh, during certain training sessions alongside the first team. So that's, I mean, he's, he knows that our club through and through. Can he save this season? Let's say if he were to come in, after League's Cup or something, I don't know. By then, the season might be gone. I'm not really sure, but I don't know, man. I, I definitely think he is a massive upgrade to what we have with Nico Estevez, at least this season's version of him. So I don't probably know, man. We'll thing, find man. out. Pro probably. I just the, – the biggest example of his development that I can, I guess, uh, give – or could say, talk about is – and now this guy isn't a uh, an Academy product, but do you remember how much – better Fabian Castillo got underneath Oscar Preya and how, how much he had blossomed to the point where he got a move to Europe and a uh, national team call up to Colombia in 2015 when that was unheard of that yeah. a 22 year old was getting a call up uh, that played in MLS predominantly uh, to Colombia. So yeah, I mean, I think his work speaks for itself. Um, I don't know if he's going to win MLS cups, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, like a top manager would regularly, but he's better than what you've had, at least in your last two stops. I agree wholeheartedly. And I think more importantly, too, he does what we have yet to see Nico do this season, which is adjust. I think mm -hmm. he under, he can build a system around these players that actually fits the personnel that he has. Whereas I feel like, again, I said a poor man's a version of Burhalter ball earlier. This is what Ber Nico and Josh Wolf, you'll notice there's a lot almost in common between those two managers. They both were assistants under Burhalter. They don't do those things. What they do is they have this idea of how they want to play a system that's usually pretty intricate that maybe they saw Barcelona play once and they're like, oh, that looks pretty cool. So let's do that, even though we don't have the personnel to make that system work. Let's go ahead and try it and stick with it anyway, because that's the way that I want to play. That does not work. And MLS, you have to really cater to the team that you have, the personnel that you have, and create something that allows them to be successful, not force them to play the, the way that you want to play. So I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens, man. But look, it, it would be a shocker to me if Dallas were to at least net a point out of this. If it, if, if it was, I will call it a W, absolutely, and just move on to the next game, 100%. But we'll see how it goes, man. We both have LAFC taking this one. All right, let's move on to our fourth matchup of the day, Vancouver hosting the Colorado Rapids. This one to me is actually going to be a banger. Um, sixth versus seventh in the West. Uh, two kind of smaller market teams, but Vancouver, one of the most efficient teams in Major League Soccer at this moment. Six, four, and five, coming off that 2 1 win over SKC and hosting a Colorado team that at times looks good, right? They, you know, George Mahalovich is kind of moving. Uh, they're able to kind of, kind of create spaces and chances very fluidly. You know, even win big games on the road against good teams. I'm thinking back to that road run against NYCFC um, at, at, at kind of the start of May. Uh, but then they have times where we don't see that and it feels kind of stale and the movement's not really there and they give up easy goals. Um, and and maybe it feels a, in those games, it feels a little bit like 2023 Colorado Rapids. I don't know. This team under Chris Armis is interesting, right? I think that you kind of get them hot or cold, there's no in between. But nonetheless, right, they sit at seventh in the West. They did just lose to a Houston Dynamo team that hasn't been able to score against anybody, but was able to net three against these Rapids. So 
With that said, man, to me, this is kind of very close to call, very tight. How do you see this one going? Well, it's like uh, I honestly think, even though these teams are different, like uh, philosophy wise, they're they're just a lot of there's a lot of parallels between these teams. It's almost like the Spider Man meme. Two small, like very similar markets. Uh, you know, Colorado's probably a little bigger than Vancouver, but just they're both small market teams. They don't spend the most money, um, but they both are performing very well this year. Vancouver, they've kind of hit a wall. I would say I I wouldn't say that they're like bad, but this is kind of like the first like struggle they've had this season, even though they did uh, were able to get a win over sporting Kansas city. But we talked about how that's not necessarily like something to be excited about with how bad they've been this year. Um, you know, I, this, this is a, this is an interesting game, man. I can see this going so many ways. Honestly, I could, you know, it just depends on like, um, I honestly think it's going to, it's going to be like a goalkeeping matchup. It's going to be, uh, you know, uh, Takoka versus, you know, Stefan, which one's going to be able to, 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 you know, prevail, um, you know, and oh, man, I don't know this, this, this is honestly, this is a match that I definitely will probably end up watching because of how similar both these teams are just to see what happens. And I'll be curious to see if Brian white can kind of like pick things back up again. He's kind of, he's been kind of hot and cold this year up top for Vancouver. Uh, Ryan Gallat obviously has been very good. He's been very good since he signed with Vancouver. Um, and, you know, Colorado, they invested quite a bit, maybe not as much as like other clubs have. You know, they're not spending a 10 million on a striker, but they're adding uh, Stefan, Sam Vines, obviously Jordi Mihaljevic. They're adding like MLS veterans or pieces that have played in the league before that are good. Yeah. And um, it's really paying off for them. I'm still not very sold. I'm not sold on Chris Armas. I still think he's a mediocre manager. <laughs> and um, I think the West is, you know, we used this word or term earlier, down bad. I think the West is kind of down bad outside of like the top four teams. Yeah. And I think that that's why these teams kind of look better than they actually are. Uh, I don't I don't think if Colorado was in the East, they would be in the playoff contention right now. Not to say they're bad. I'm not saying that they're a bad team. I'm yeah. just saying like, you know, they're six, four and six, right? So they've got four draws and they got six losses. How many more matches would they probably have lost if they're competing in that stack, that star studded East? That's true. That's true. Now, now if you want to compare apples to apples, I, I like that comparison, by the way. If you want to compare apples to apples, that right there would put them roughly in the same spot in the East. But again, you know, where Charlotte FC is right now. And Charlotte has had to play, right? The likes of Cincinnati, the likes of uh, Columbus. Um, you know, Toronto is right. even looking pretty good this season. Like, They've really had to kind of grind out some of these tough games where at the end of the day, the Rapids get to sometimes play against San Jose or Both Seattle New York teams. or like Dallas. Literally, <laughs> yeah, there, there's just so many good teams in the East. And like, uh, I think Colorado, anybody who wouldn't say that they've improved this year would just be lying to themselves. They definitely have improved this year, but they also are benefiting from a weaker conference. And the Whitecaps obviously are as well. Um, I think that, you know, we were talking about a tier list, right? Like, uh, I can't remember which club it was earlier, but you, we were saying that this team isn't bad, but they're not necessarily good. I think that these clubs would kind of fall into that, like, average tier. They're just kind of like a product of a bad conference. Uh, but I think this is going to be a good game, and uh, maybe uh, they can add some pieces, even though I, I really don't see either one of these clubs being, like, too active in the summer transfer window, they'll probably just ride with what they have. Maybe make one small piece, uh, maybe one small addition or two. Nothing crazy, sure. um, but but this this is this is like a very good matchup. And it, I guess it just comes down when you come to this. It's like go, come down to this. It's like who do you think has a better man, manager? Uh, do you think it's Santini or do you think it's uh, or do you think it's Arm Armas? And I and I, you know, I definitely would go with the latter. Yeah. Um... I think they're both, you know, kind of, there, there's not a ton that separates them. I I mean, I like, if I pick the team that I like more and how they play, I like Vancouver a little bit more. Uh, I think that they, they offer just more consistency. I think they, um, uh, they have a very distinct way of playing even it's pretty direct actually. Right. Like I, there's not a ton of buildup. Like a lot of uh, Ryan Gall's goals sometimes are just coming on the break and, and they're finding a way to, to feed him into open space and he gets a goal, uh, against the run of play and we even saw the goal he had I think it was last night it might have been at the weekend but I, I think it was last night where the ball was just given away to him and yeah. he picked it up ran with it slotted in the back of the net and that that's that, that's that's probably I don't think it's the epitome of being a Caps fan and what you can expect game in and game out but it happens more often than you think and yeah. so um, I, I, I always say they're very efficient and they kind of just know who they are and play into it fully um, you know in this game 
I mean, if you look at just how I, I expect it to go fully, I mean, Vancouver hasn't kept a clean sheet in like seven or eight games now. Yeah. Um, they haven't won at home in a little while now, maybe a month or close to it. It's it's been it's it's been a while. Um, but I think that they break that duck here. I think Vancouver is going to find a way to make this this game very difficult for Colorado. Um, and I think you, you mentioned keepers before, where this might be battle of the keepers. I think Zach Steffen's the one who loses. Um, I think Steffen, to me, this might be a hot take. I actually think that he might even be considered a downgrade from what they had. Um, I think you look at the numbers, right? Zach Steffen, I have an interesting stat here. Zach Steffen has allowed 7.4 goals above what was expected going into the season on average and is doing worse than their former keeper, Marlo Illich, on a per 90 level. So, And what's crazy to me, because I, I can't even think of how many p- people were shouting, and m- most notably, I remember the tweet exactly. Tom Boger put out something about, like, uh, he's a shoe-in for being goalkeeper of the year, and he hadn't even, he hadn't even... He had just signed the contract. He hadn't even stepped foot on a MLS pitch just yet. And we're already saying, like, yeah, it's Zach Steffen. Do he play at Manchester City? I mean, he's going to come in and just dominate this league. It's like, no, that's not how this works. Um, and so, that, and that, I think for that reason, right, like, maybe he gets exposed in this game. Maybe he doesn't. I don't really know. He's but- a definition of down bad, man. I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen a national team player fallen from grace as much as I've seen him. He was the clear-cut future number one for us. He had a great stint at – Columbus after coming here from I want to say I can't remember which uh, German club it was but I think he was playing for their second division team came over here did very well for us looked really promising obviously gets sold to Man City gets loaned out to Stuttgart I think was the or I'm trying to it was uh, it it was Middlesbrough I think he I think he got loaned out to a uh, German club for one year before that though. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. He did. He did. Um he bounced around a lot, to be honest. He did, man. Like, he like did. One, once he started fucking up at City, like and having it wasn't just injuries, it was like actual mistakes. Yeah. They they really found a way to, to not really have to play him ever again. Yeah. No, it, he I don't actually I don't think you're I think you're right. I don't think it was Stuttgart. It was some it was another German club though. It was in the Bundesliga, it was in the first division. He had a shaky uh, sent there and then he did go to Millsboro and uh, he just never recovered man and the sad thing is he's only 29 years old it's not like he's fucking washed or something age wise I mean he could still bounce back but he, it's like his confidence is just fucking tanked like yeah. he's just a shell of himself and yeah the fact that anybody would say he's shoe in for goalkeeper of the year obviously doesn't watch a lot of uh, soccer overseas uh, we won't get into that though yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I just think that that's just, that's silly. And, um, Takoka, you know, he was a good goalkeeper. Obviously the defense has kind of been shaky for Vancouver recently. Um, but I think he's actually a better goalkeeper than Stefan at this point. Um, you know, I, I think that that's the case and that's why I think it's going to be a battle between both of them. Who's going to let the goals pour in? Who's going to leak more goals between the two? I think it'll be Stefan. I think I, I, I'm back in Vancouver in this one. I think Colorado maybe gets a goal. Sure. They have playmakers over there. I'll, I'll give it, I'll, I'll give them a goal, but I think it's going to be, Two or even three to one. I think at BC Place, it's a diff. It's, there's a lot of miles Colorado will put on themselves just even heading up there to Canada. So they'll have to get out there um, on West Coast in that stadium where really it is the stadium in Canada. They play all of their their big matches for the national team, both men's and women's, at that stadium. I think it's going to be a difficult place to go in there and try and net out a result. Um, and who knows? We might see um, a step in disaster class. I'm not really sure, but. I I'm back in Vancouver this one. How about you? Yeah, Vancouver. I, I would say I'd probably have it two one. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's a fair result, and and that's not even us shitting on Colorado. That that is literally just like I think that is kind of where these teams are. It is going to be a close game, sixth versus seventh, but I think Vancouver's probably going to take it. All right, and finally, um, our last deep dive before we go to quick fire predictions. Atlanta United, led by the. I was going to say the amazing, but maybe he's not so amazing. Gonzalo Pineda um, <laughs> hosting <laughs> Charlotte FC. Um, and 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 almost the exact opposite. We think about man- manager stints right now, right? Dean Smith outperforming many expectations um, coming into the season. We've had even other creators come onto this show and shit on him. Like, 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 like he wasn't going to be able to do what he did overseas in any way, shape, or form here in MLS, or at least not have that type of impact. And I think he's showing with a pretty limited squad, right? Look at this. 
Seventh in the East. Yes, they just lost to a good, a good Red Bulls team. Um, but 22 points, 6-4 six, and six, 6 with still some room to go. I mean, I think Atlanta United fans would take their situation in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. And they're going to be at home for this one. The Mercedes-Benz used to be a fortress. I say that because they've lost, I think, two or three games at home already. Four in a row. Four, four in a row. row. Four in yeah, a row. Yeah, first time in history. Four in a row. Dude, it's insane, man. Like, like and that, granted, they just beat Inter Miami. Maybe it was a fluke. Maybe it wasn't. But look, man, can they build on that with all of these rumors surrounding Yakomakis leaving to Mexico, with Almada maybe leaving to Europe in the summer? Like, can they put all that bullshit aside and just say, look, we need to tee up for this game, get a second positive result in a row? Is this the is this where it happens? Oh man, I, I think that that um, I think that Miami win was an outlier. Honestly, I don't think they're going to replicate that. I think there's too much. I mean, like I said, I think it's the Titanic sinking, and it's just it's staying afloat. Maybe another game. Um, I just think there's too much there's too much turmoil and chaos in this club. Just that, like you know, ha- band aid job, a, a gaping hole in the boat. You know, I mean, it, it is a nice win, right? And it definitely distracted people even in the short term. But I mean, they they still have they still have a lot of issues. And if it wasn't for uh, uh, Saba, you know, having two insane goals against Miami, this could have been a different storyline. And, yeah. um, you know, and, and we talked about the Barca boys kind of having an off game. You know, that has to play in the equation as well. I don't think it was something tactically that Pineda did that took them out of the match, right? I just think that they had a bad game. Um, so I think that this is... Uh, Oh, I, I I definitely think I would favor Charlotte. And it's crazy. You know, this is back-to-back. I think these two clubs are very similar, Jose, because these are two small market teams that have very ambitious owners that are willing to spend a lot of money on their clubs. And yeah. I think that that's why, that, that, you know, that's why they're kind of like another Spider-Man meme. You know, they're willing to spend even if they're a small market. So um, I just think I think Atlanta's down, man. They're just down bad, and I think Pineda's uh, firing is is, um, is inevitable. I just don't I don't see him surviving this season. There, there's just too much. Yes, he got a win against Miami, but man, four home losses in a row at Mercedes Benz uh, Stadium, the that's fortress. Insane. Seventy thousand fans have been in that stadium. You know, I mean, that's like what the fuck, like an alternate universe. Like that seemed unthinkable to lose four in a row there. It, I mean, this team isn't like it isn't like they don't have any talent. They have yeah. really good talent. They have very good talented players. Maybe not as good as like the Tata Martino era, but it's not like they're San Jose or or you know New England or something. It's crazy, man. They're literally bottom ten in the league in goals scored per match, and that's that they have Tiago Almada and Yakomakis on that on that roster. And granted, and Yakomakis didn't even play until like what the he came in like the eighty second minute, eighty third yeah. minute against Miami. So yeah. I think he we should all expect him to be back for for this game and like maybe you know get the goals that they will need because keep in mind Charlotte they're not a slouch. You know I think for for past seasons coming since, since coming into this league. They've, they've kind of been that Bybee team that are like, oh, it's, it's awesome, you know, at the bank down in Charlotte. You know, they don't really lose there. There's a ton of fans. Like, it's straight vibes. I get it. But but you've always kind of known that they've been that very fringe wild card team, right? Barely scra- find a way to scrape it to playoffs and then massively exit at the same time, never really being that impressive. I think this Charlotte team feels a little bit different. Right now, they hold the most clean sheets in MLS with seven. That is something that I think Atlanta needs to be wary of. They need to find a way to come out firing on all cylinders. And in all honesty, if they want to have a chance at winning this game, I think they got to score first, and it has to come in the first half. I think if it goes nil-nil into the second half and they they start feeling pressure from the home crowd to deliver a result, especially after the Miami win, it may be – I think right now, mentally – they're a little bit weaker than we've seen Atlanta in quite some time. I think that's going to play a factor into this one. So – I don't know, man. Um, to me, I feel like this is one of those ones where I feel like a draw might be incoming. If Charlotte were to win, oh man, I Pineda might be fired instantly, despite despite the Miami win. I, I think that at the end of the day, like it's cool, it's a one off win against a good team. But if you turn around and lose at home again to a team that you probably still have a really good chance of beating with all your players in the field. That then it's like you, you're right back where you were. You didn't take a positive bounce forward. You took one step forward and two steps back. And mm-hmm. I think at that point, right, uh, ownership has to make a decision and, and try to salvage what they have of this season because at the end of the day, the expectation was pretty high. So 
I'm gonna say a draw, like a like a a one one probably. Um, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't surprise me if Charlotte were to now to win this one. How do you see it going? I think it's gonna be I think it's gonna be two one Charlotte. I'm not bought into Atlanta. And here's another thing that I, I think is in play. I think if they lose this game, I think they're going to sell Yakamakis, not only because the fee that Cruz Azul is offering them is more than fair for a 30-year-old striker, but I think that if they fire Pineda, which seems inevitable, like I said, they're going to want to sell off these valuable assets they can still get a good fee for, like Almada or Yakamakis, and then try to rebuild in the uh, in the winter. Maybe the summer, I think they'd probably push it back to the winter and not try to rush any bad signings like they yeah. did with uh, like a Ruju uh, a couple years ago. That was turned out to be kind of a bad signing they made like last minute. Um, I, I think that this is Pineda... Uh, this is this is him coaching for his life, man, or his job. This is it. The, I, if he loses this game, he is cooked. You cannot yeah. lose five games in a row at home and expect to keep your job in Atlanta. I agree wholeheartedly. The standard is too high there, especially considering the, the history that they have. Um, hey, ain't no way. So I think this is a absolute must win it for Atlanta. Uh, but with that said, um, you know we've seen crazier results already this season happen in this league. It would not surprise either of us to see Charlotte walk away with this one. So we'll find out. We'll find out. But that ends our uh, deep dive segment as part of the uh, match day 18 prediction. So with that said, as always, it's kind of the fun part of our episode. We'll quick fire the remaining eight games for match day 18, and then we'll wrap this video up. All right? So Will, let's dive in, bro. Uh, we'll start with the Friday game. This week, there is a Friday night game. It is NYCFC hosting San Jose. Kind of a weird matchup. Um, cross country for the Quakes. Um, how does that impact your, your prediction? I got NYCFC winning this one. They're they're on a they're on a streak right now. I think they've won. I want to say that they've won like five of their last seven matches or they're unbeaten their last seven matches. Nick Cushing's got turned around. I, I got New York City FC in this one. It's crazy, right? People saying Nick Cushing has this that has this team turned around. It's wild. Uh, I think it's like four wins in a row, too, if I'm, if I'm correct. Yeah, I think it's four in a row and it's like five of their last seven are wins and they're they're unbeaten in their last seven. Yeah, it's insane, it's crazy. Man. Yeah. Crazy. Um, feeling like 2021 all over again. I'm gonna yeah. go same NYCFC. Um, and I'm gonna say two one. I'm gonna say two one. All right. Uh DC hosting Toronto. I got I got Toronto on that one, man. Mm, this one's interesting. Uh, because DC is so hot and cold, man. Like, like one day Pateki shows up and scores, you know, a brace, and the next, like, they don't create enough you know volume for him up front, and they just kind of net out a, a, a draw or a loss. I'll go against the grain here. I'm going to go DC. I'm going to go DC at home 1-0. No. We'll see what happens. Um, Red Bulls hosting Orlando. Red Bulls. Yeah, I, I back Red Bulls this one. What, what, what score do you have, though? Because this, Man, this they, one's they, out of hand, to be honest. It, it could. I mean, it could be It could be another 3-1 win for uh, the Red Bulls. Forsberg is just playing so well. And, and I said this on my uh, Power Rankings episode I did with, with Favi, uh, Favi and Rankle. Yeah. Uh, uh, Forsberg is an MVP candidate. He just doesn't have the statistics to really put him in that conversation. But if you watch him play, you really see what he's done for this team and how effective and how much better they are because of him. Yeah, I agree, bro. And that, by the way, that free kick goal, man, man. Beautiful. Just, a absolutely. I think RB Leipzig misses that maybe a little bit. But uh, yeah, man, I think Forsberg, he's been he's been clinical for for, R, for RB so far this season. So I, I'm with you. I think it's going to be like a, like a 3-1. I think Orlando's still capable of getting a goal, but Red Bull should win this one at home. All right, um, Philadelphia hosting Montreal. Montreal came out of nowhere yesterday, by the way. Good Lord. Uh, was it 4-2? Yeah. I, I, and to me, Philly's mid this season. I don't know why. They just don't play like they, they usually do. Um, but Montreal's down bad right now, minus minus the one result. It was, it was the weird Wednesday, man. Let's be honest. Like, I... I, I, I <laughs> There were so many weird results yesterday. Yeah. I, I don't think there was a single game where I'm like, you know, that makes sense. Like maybe actually the LAFC match, I would say probably did make sense because, you know, uh, that they should win at home because of how good they've been. But um, I, I would say I got Philadelphia over Montreal because Montreal is just kind of like, you know, they're just they're just there. They're not yeah. really, they're not really trying for anything. Uh, I would I would probably I would edge it out. Maybe like a two one victory over Montreal in Philly's favor. I'm going to say 1-1. One, one. I, mean, I think it's a draw. I think uh, it'll be interesting. And, and they just drew Toronto in the midweek matchup. So two back-to-back -back draws for Philly at home would be actually kind of crazy for Curtin. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not that big on Jim Curtin, but we'll see what happens. Me either. 
Uh, Chicago hosting LA Galaxy. Um, hmm. Hmm. Let's see. Yeah. I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. Let's see. I don't know. Did you see? You know, we do that that beautiful run of play we saw against oh my Orlando, God, dude. The, the most shithousery goal I have seen in quite some time. It had Sunday League vibes written all over it. Chicago <laughs> Fire are so down bad, man. It's insane. Insane. They are spiraling, um, man. Are they not the definition of spiraling? I mean, they my have God. to be. It's yeah. crazy. And, and dude, for anybody wow. who did, who, I, I'm, I'm curious if anybody at home tuned into this part of MLS 360 when that was happening, like right, right before it, the whole crew was just dunking on Chicago. Like it was, I don't know, it was wild. I think Bradley Wright Phillips probably the only person sticking up for them at least a little bit. And then that whole play happened, and he shut right up. Like he didn't say anything about <laughs> <hot> after that. <laughs> this is um, ugly, man. This is how bad. How bad. Way. Oh man, I mean, you know, you know, we talked about Dallas and LA being close, and even that got the score line didn't look pretty, right? I mean, yeah. it wasn't good. I mean, this could be a four nil win. Maybe yeah. this could be like a Gabriel Peck coming out game where he he just goes off and has a brace or a hat trick just because he's so damn fast and, and good with the ball. And and Bricky Pooj is really good too. He's kind of like in that Forsberg discussion of maybe he doesn't have those assists or goals, but he is very vital to what they do. Hell, I think they could probably honestly like rotate. Uh, at least Ricky Pooch, like, like like some of these guys who have played week in and week out for them with some of the midweek matches. I would think about that. Like, hey, yeah, you play the wire, and it's not an like automatic dub, but you feel pretty confident going into this game and with, with, with what their form looks like. I would maybe I, I don't know where Jovalich's legs are at, you know, because he just came back from injury like maybe a couple weeks ago. Yeah, maybe give Miguel Barry some time. You know, maybe give Fagunda some more minutes. You know, I don't know. I think there's a lot of opportunity for the Galaxy to maybe rotate here and still get a result. If they rotate, I think it'll be a clinical two nil. If they don't and they just flat out let the starters fly, <laughs> this could get really bad. Um, yeah, I'm gonna say somewhere between two and four nil. Uh, something along those lines. I don't see Fire having a shot in hell in this one. All right, uh, Minnesota hosting Sporting Kansas City. Another one that, good lord, man, it could get really bad. Minnesota, yeah, Minnesota, Minnesota. yeah, probably, should, probably, t- probably t- I'd say two nil, Minnesota. Yeah, man, the Allianz. Um, at this time of the year, I know it's battle of the Midwest, but I, I, I actually like what I've seen coming out of the fans of that stadium. And again, do, doing what they're doing this season with that Reynoso, by the way, who I, I just saw uh, a picture of him uh, training with, uh, with Solos down in, uh, in Mexico. He just officially so. got transferred today. Yeah. So, yeah. hey, man, power to you. I think you did it the wrong way entirely, but, hey, I mean, to each their own. Exactly. Own. Yeah, Minnesota in this one, 100%. Uh, Nashville hosting New England. Is, is, oh. this, is this a trap game? Fuck, man, that's like the worst game of the week, right? Jesus, that's like, uh, th- hey, this is the type of game where you thank God there is all these games congested, so you don't have <laughs> so, you, so you actually have a valid excuse of why not to watch this shit. No highlights uh, MLS 360 from this one. No. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. This is this is going to be a low light game. I mean, <laughs> this is like the definition of mid off, right? I, I mean, you have yeah. New England, probably the worst team in the league, and then Nashville's obviously shit. Uh, they have an interim head coach. Uh, by the way, did you see that 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 crazy uh, post that the communications team at MLS posted yesterday w- with Nashville? Um, no, I did not actually. So, so they obviously have an interim coach. They posted some graphic about congratulations so and so is the second manager in club history to win a regular season match and i'm just like what the fuck what kind of stat is that like oh yeah if there's a guy the second coach of course he's the second one to win a fucking match like i know bro it was slow news day slow news yeah i was like damn dude i mean i was like i can't believe that this is where we're at but all right they had to meet a kpi you know what i mean like they had to meet the metrics you know it's like hey we we gotta get a post out there So, so I wonder when the third manager comes, if they're going to say, this is the third manager in club history to win a match. Um, oh, but yeah, that's a, hey, that is like literally a down bad comment right there. That is like Bro. the definition of a down bad comment. Uh, this is going to be, I think this is going to be a scoreless draw. It's going to be nil nil. I don't think that either one of these teams are going to score. I think it's going to be a fucking just absolute snooze fest. I was going to ask, snooze fest of the week? This one? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, by far. Is. Probably is. Oof, that's tough. Maybe maybe Caleb Porter will have some nicer things to say um, after this one. I don't know, man. He's he's been he's 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 thrown a couple fits lately. Um, yeah, we'll we'll see. And then finally, Portland hosting Houston. Portland coming off of that dub against Austin, man. Can they beat back to back Texas teams? 
Oh, this is going to be an interesting game. This is why, I mean, on the surface, you would think this is going to be equally as shitty as the Nashville, um, the Nashville, uh, New England game, but both teams are coming off wins. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, Houston just won three, one over, Oh God, who was the team they just beat? They beat a pretty decent team, right? Who was the team they just uh, beat? Colorado. Colorado. Colorado, yeah, Colorado. That's right, Colorado, three one. Yeah, that's an impressive win. Um, I would say, I would say, I, Houston. I, I don't know. I, I think Herrera might might be a linchpin in the for the club and kind of get things turned around to where they're competing again. Uh, now that he's back and healthy, I, I think I have Houston in this match. I think it's going to be a like maybe a one nil win. Oh, that's that's an interesting pick. It's kind of spicy too, just considering that Portland. You know they. I, I don't rate Phil Neville as a manager at all. Um, I, I think, no. you know, he, he it, a lot of what happened in Miami wasn't his fault, but like, I just don't think he's like the head coach I want for my team. Um, but, and they, they, I will say this, Portland can score. They just can't stop anybody from scoring. Like it doesn't matter who it is. They did get a shutout against Austin. I will give them that. That was kind of weird, but it really shouldn't have worked out that way. Driussi missed a PK. He missed a sitter. Like, they could have gotten those goals had they been more clinical. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I mean, this is probably personal bias. I'm an FC Dallas fan. I'm gonna back Portland. Uh, I think Portland wins two one. I think that Houston gets a goal for sure. Um, but I think you know at home maybe there's something, some of that there for Portland. Cabecita looked pretty good against Austin. Maybe carry some of that into the Houston game. We'll find out. But we are split on that result. But, man, that is it. That is our video for today, bro. I think, first off, Will, you absolutely crushed it, man. I think your takes were spot on. I think uh, hopefully you make this show look a whole lot better than we looked from the midweek predictions because I'll be honest, man, I might have been, like, the front runner um, in terms of, like, who got the most predictions correct. And I think I only got, like, four matches right. Like, it was it was the most MLS week of all time. It was insane. Like, if anybody's putting money on the games, Godspeed, oh. man, because I'm willing to bet that uh, – you probably didn't do so well. But uh, with that said, man, uh, thank you again, Will, for absolutely coming on the show, dropping more than a few bangers, more than a few spicy takes. Uh, I definitely want to give you a, a quick moment to, you know, of course, plug your channel, your content, and we'll definitely do so in the description notes down below. Before I get to that, take it away, my man. Yeah, so you guys can follow me at MLS Moves on Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. I'm mostly on Twitter and YouTube. Uh, I have a channel I just started a couple months ago. I'm posting all kinds of different MLS content. Some you'll agree with, some you'll find, uh, you know, you'll probably think I'm stupid for saying. Uh, we've got some interviews and some good things coming up. We're going to have my buddy Jose on the, on the channel sometime soon. And uh, we're also going to be doing a live stream for the CONCACAF Champions Cup final on Saturday. So if you get a chance, you guys should stop by and, you know, just say hey, and hopefully MLS can prevail. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. They better prevail. I'll say that. But you guys are good, but crew better win this. Will Fernandzi, get ready, bro. You better be ready. And guys, I, I and what Will said, I mean it, man. Uh, a great friend of mine, great friend of the show. And more than anything, man, we what we're about here, not just at Wake Up MLS, but Goals TV, is supporting these content creators who I believe are significantly more knowledgeable than any of the pundits are tuning into on any of these media networks. And I'll be honest, that includes Apple TV from my perspective. So, you know, go check him out. MLS Moves on Twitter, on YouTube. He just did a fantastic Power Rankings video with our boy Fabian Rankel. Go check that out. A ton of great content. They were even going at it a little bit um, on some of the takes. I loved every minute of it. So, again, Will, thank you so much for, for coming on the show today, for doing these predictions with me. Guys, we're going to get him back on here at some point with more of the regulars here on Wake Up MLS. And I have a feeling when we do, it's going to be a lot of fun. But I'll link his channel, everything MLS moves down in the description notes below. Go check him out. It's always a good time. He's great at telling stories. And, man, MLS uh, needs more creators like him in this space. All right? So, anyway, with that said, those are our predictions for this week. If you haven't done so already, like the video down below. Subscribe to the channel. We're growing. We want to bring more fans into this thing. Can't do it without your help. And we definitely appreciate it. Everybody here at Wake Up MLS. My name is Jose. That's Will. We'll catch you guys next time.